We're going to continue in our series today in 1 Peter uh, chapter 4. Our sermon series entitled, Nothing uh, to Fear. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and be turning there with me. If you haven't done so, as you get kind of settled in, let me give you some quick announcements this morning. I know that we don't really like having announcements, but we've got to do that a little bit at different times. But a few things going on that are coming up I want to remind you of. So first of all, uh, so youth summer camp. Uh, we've not done a good job, and that's my fault of advertising this, but Andy uh, has put in a lot of work. So June 27th through July 1st, uh, if you've got a child uh, in the age range of 6th grade up through high school, we would love for you to come spend the whole week out at Locust Springs. It's a great time of just enjoying one another, uh, growing together, and, and more than that, more importantly, just growing in the Lord. Uh, so there's also a sign-up sheet out there if you're interested in helping as an adult volunteering for that. Uh, then we also have membership class, and we've had to change this several times, again, uh, just different things, different factors, but membership class, so if you're interested in Encompass, hey, what do we believe in, you know, what are we really about, what's our mission here, that will be July 11th, uh, and then finally our last announcement this morning, uh, some Bible school dates, uh, so we don't do our typical Bible school uh, just for a whole week, we just ain't ready for that, like mentally and physically, uh, praise God for the churches that can, we like to do it one night on a Wednesday, then take a week off and do it another night on a Wednesday so we can recover uh, from what we're doing, uh, but those dates will be July 14th. The 21st, the 28th, and August 4th, and also a sign-up sheet out there, if at all possible, you can help us with that there. Uh, so a lot going on uh, over the summer, and, and we understand, we recognize that church in the summer is hard. Uh, there's a lot of people going a hundred different directions, a lot of people traveling, vacationing. We're actually leaving right after uh, service today to go on vacation, uh, and that's less of an announcement, more of a prayer request probably. I've uh, been in the car for 10 hours with my kids. It's not going to be pretty. Uh, so over the next few hours, you want to send us some encouraging Bible verses about how to love the unlovable, uh, what the Bible says about like road rage, those things would be appreciated. Uh, but look, we know, we understand that you can't be here all the time. We, we get that totally, but we want to encourage you. Uh, be here as much as you can. And when you're here, don't just come to sit. No, come here to serve. Uh, That's what we see is the call of God's people. We're going to talk more about that next week. But for this week, we get into 1 Peter chapter 4. So let's pray and just jump in this morning. Father, we come to you in desperate need of you. God, we just praise you for your goodness, for your mercy. God, we just come to you as broken people. As Casey said, we just feel like we have so many reasons not to sing. We have so many reasons to complain and grumble and say, this ain't right, this ain't fair. But God, help us to realize, God, you hold the whole world in your hands. And still yet, God, you love us. You are concerned about us. What is man that you are mindful of us, yet you are, and we praise you for that. God, we come to you as sinful people. As people who need to see your goodness and let it drive us to holiness. Let's go, we ask your word would speak to us through, through that, in that direction this morning. God, let your word be exalted and lifted up. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So there's a story once told about a man named Harry Randall Truman. And you say, this is not President Truman. No, this was Mr. Truman, who was a military man who fought back in World War I. This was Mr. Truman who in his later years in life lived in Washington State back in the 1960s and 70s. You see, Mr. Truman, he was the owner. He was the caretaker of what was Mount St. Helens Lodge. And here you'll see is a picture of Mr. and Mrs. Truman and the lodge. But you see, for Mr. Truman, he was your typical man. Like he was one of those men who were stubborn. He's one of those guys who no matter how hard you tried, you couldn't convince of anything that he did not want to be convinced of. And women, you don't know any men like that, do you? No, of course not. But you see, unfortunately, for Mr. Truman, he was so stubborn, he was so hard-headed, that even though for months, scientists had come and had been warning everybody in the area of Mount St. Helen which, if you didn't know, was a very large, very active volcano up above Portland. But these scientists have been coming in, warning people. They had done whatever scientists do, and they said, hey, here's what we've understood, here's what we've researched and found out. Like this volcano, this activity is telling us, hey, this thing is about to blow. And not about to blow like a fireworks show. No, it's about to blow and take everything out and destruct everything around it. 
So in other words, they concluded his volcano is about to wreak havoc. And so for months, the authorities have been sounding the alarm and warning the people of the looming danger. They've been telling people, hey, listen, you've got to get out of here. You have to evacuate. Yet despite the seriousness of the threats, some people chose to disregard the warnings. You see, one of those people who chose to disregard the warnings. So one of those people who said, hey, thanks for telling me. I appreciate it, but I'm good, was none other than Mr. Truman. And so on May 18th of 1980, at 8.30 a.m., the volcano did what the scientists said it would do. The volcano erupted. And Truman and his entire lodge that you see here were buried underneath 150 feet of mud and debris from the volcanic eruption. Needless to say, Mr. Truman's body was never found. Probably more likely because it was just burned up from the heat of the explosion. You see, I think what happened, Mr. Truman, it leads us to a question this morning. First of all, why would anybody ever live next to a volcano, right? Like, that's question number one. But secondly, like, why in the world would Mr. Truman not leave the city? So why after being warned by some really, really smart people who told him, listen, you're going to die if you don't get out of here, who told him, hey, this volcano is going to take you out. Like, why in the world would he not listen? And I'm sure if you were able to talk to him, there have been a lot of factors in his decision. But what people say was his main reason that he wouldn't listen was really this. He'd always say, hey, I love where I'm at way too much to ever leave it. I love where I'm at way too much to ever let go of it. Listen, as we make our way into 1 Peter chapter 4 this morning, I think Peter, in the opening of this chapter, it's basically playing for us the same role that scientists played for Mr. Truman and the people up near Mount St. Helens. Like I think essentially what Peter is saying is this. I think he's saying to you and me, listen, a lot of us are living somewhere that is very, very dangerous. Like a lot of you in your life, you're living next to a volcano that's about to erupt and take you out. And so the question that we have to answer this morning is this. Do you love where you're at? Do you personally love where you're living, how you're living, too much to ever leave it? Do you love how you're leaving too much to ever give it up? Because I don't know if you caught it or not, but when Daniel was reading our sermon text this morning, really the focus here in this text is a focus on everybody's favorite subjects. It's a focus on our sin. And you see, this is what Peter is saying when it comes to sin. So when it comes to our living how we want to live, as opposed to living as how God, who holds the whole world in his hands, has said we are supposed to live. Like, that's how I would summarize what sin is. So sin is essentially taking this approach. God, you move over, you get out of the way because my way is better than yours. That's what sin is. What Peter's saying in regards to sin, he's saying you better get out. He's saying when it comes to sin, he's saying you better run. Like he's trying to convince us of the simple but important truth that this, that it's time. It's time for you to stop loving your sin in the present and start leaving your sin in the past before it's too late. That'll preach, won't it? When I say that'll preach, that's where y'all say amen. Okay, just make me feel better about myself. That'll preach, won't it? Amen. But think about that church. Think about this statement that we're seeing here. But see, here's the reality when it comes to sin. There are so many people who are more like Mr. Truman than maybe they even realize. Like there's no doubt so many people, especially people like most of us, who've grown up around church for a while now. So people like us who know the danger of sin, who know very well the destruction of sin, who know even the devastation that sin can cause, so most of us here this morning, we know what sin brings. We know that sin brings now what it's always brought ever since Genesis 3 and the fall of man. Look, even though a lot of church-going people know that, even though they know what it can do, 
Even though they know what it's inevitably eventually going to do, they still love their sin too much not to do. They still love their sin too much to ever actually leave it behind. And look, this is where the problem comes in. Because look, I don't think it's going to surprise anybody to hear me say this morning, hey, guess what? You should not love your sin. Like, I don't think anybody's going to hear that and think, oh, I've never heard that before. Let me write that down. No, we know that we shouldn't love our sin. We know that we shouldn't even like our sin. No, we know that we should actually detest our sin. I mean, I get the question all the time. Hey, Jesse, how do I know? How can I be sure that I'm truly saved? And look, that's a loaded question. There's a lot that can go into that. But when I get that question, one of the ways that I tell people for them to examine their salvation, like God's Word tells us to do in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, is to see, hey, what is your take on your sin? So I ask them, hey, if you can sin regularly, if you can sin consistently and like it, and there be no conviction, so there's no godly grief that leads to repentance, that leads to change, like we read about in 2 Corinthians 7, that is a red flag. That's a red flag that you might have professed salvation, but there hasn't actually been any salvation. There's not been any redemption from your sin because you still love it. You still want to live in it. See, here's what I'm getting at. Just me standing up here saying, hey, you shouldn't love your sin. It's not going to be enough for you to actually leave your sin. Because again, this is nothing new. Now, we talk about sin every single Sunday. And if you go to a church that doesn't talk much about sin and repentance, let me tell you, you need to find another church. Because you're not going to a church, no, you're going to a social club. The Bible talks much about our sin. It talks much about how we need to be a repentant people. Look, if it's time, so if it's well past time that we stop loving our sin and start leaving our sin, actually start repenting from our sin, the question that we want to answer today, the question that Peter helps us answer today is this, how do we actually do that? Look, I really believe the majority of people here who might be tied up in sin, who might be in bondage to sin, who might be caught up in addiction of who knows what. I believe most of us don't want to be caught up in that addiction. Now, truthfully, are there some here who do? Probably more than likely. Like, are there some people here today who love their sins so much they have no desire to let go of it? That's probably sadly true. But I think, again, the majority of us could truthfully say, I don't want to love my sin. I don't want to live in my sin anymore. I want to get out, and I just need some help. And so what we're going to do this morning, what Peter's going to give to you and give to me, are three ways to help us stop loving, stop living in our sin. And so what we see, first of all, in this scripture, is that we stop loving our sin by recognizing we have already worn out our welcome in sin. And so think about this. So think about wearing out your welcome, like that time that that person came to your house to stay for a couple of nights, but actually ended up staying how long? Like, oh, two weeks, two months, two years. Think about wearing out your welcome. Like that time that person was coming to your house to, and I quote, just drop something off, and about eight hours later, they're still there, right? Think about that time that you hosted that party that was from five to eight. But there it was, 1130, and there's still that one person who's hanging around, not saying anything because y'all don't have anything left to say to each other, just sitting there in awkward silence. Like, that's about the time at our house we say, okay, we're about to let the dogs out. Like, if you're at our house and we say it's time to let the dogs out, that's code for you. don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. But as we think about that, that's what we mean by wearing out our welcome. And look, we all know that feeling. We all know when people wear out, when they overstay their welcome, don't we? And if you don't know that, you know what that means, right? That means you are that person who is overstaying your welcome. This is what Peter is saying in verse 3, when it comes to our sin. He's saying, look, no matter how long you've been there, you've already overstayed your welcome. He's saying, you have been there plenty long enough. Look at it in verse 3. For there has already been enough time. Brother, sister, hear me. There has already been plenty of time. 
I spent in doing what the Gentiles. So in doing what the unbelieving world does. And what they choose to do. And what does the unbelieving world choose to do? They choose to carry on an unrestrained behavior. So they choose to do whatever pleases the senses. If it feels good, they do it. They choose evil desires. They choose drunkenness. They choose orgies. They choose carousing. They choose this lawless idolatry. You see, what Peter knew was that he was writing to people who had been converted out of this sinful, ungodly, pagan backgrounds. And he knew that although they had been converted, they had been ransomed from that sin, he knew they were still influenced greatly by the presence of that very paganism. He knew they were seeing people all around them who were still living in debauchery. So Peter knew, because he had experienced it himself, that there would still be this temptation. When the Christians saw these wild, drunken parties, when they would see all these people around them living it up and sleeping around to think to themselves, huh, that doesn't look too bad. To look at that and say, hey, that actually looks kind of fun. To look at that and maybe even think, I kind of miss that way of living. And listen, church, let's be truthful. Is that not sometimes how we feel? Like sometimes can we not see how the outside world is living, what they're doing, how much fun it seems they're having, and think, man, I'm missing out. Like can we not look at that and think, that looks a lot more fun than sitting in a seat and listening to Jesse Babylon for an hour. Like I can see it on some of y'all's faces. Some of y'all just stare out that window like, I just wish I was out there and not in here. That's why we put curtains up to help you focus up here. But look, here's what I think we forget in that moment. At that moment when we see sin as appealing, we find sin as appetizing. We forget there is a reason that we left that sin in the first place. So we forget that after feeling, that especially for Christians, that sin brings with it. Because here's real talk, church. Sin feels good in the moment. Like if sin did not feel good in the moment, you know what? Nobody would sin. But sin feels good in the moment. It's like Piper said, nobody sins out of duty. Like they don't sin because they feel like they should. No, they sin because it holds out some promise of happiness. And so we sin because it feels good. You see, but that feeling of happiness of euphoria, of excitement is short-lived. Always sin comes up short on what it's promised to deliver. And so I relate the feeling that sin brings, like eating a meal at a good restaurant. So if you go to a good restaurant, and you go there, and that food looks so good, and it smells so good, and you know it's going to taste so good, what do you do with that food? You pig out, don't you? Like you eat, there we go, we're amen, and we talk about food. That's our language, right? We eat, and we eat, and we eat, and we eat, and we love it, right? It feels so good. But then about five minutes, ten minutes later, what are we feeling? Miserable, right? It's like, oh my goodness, why in the world did I eat so much? It's like we're running to get the Tums. It's like I just don't feel good at all. I've got heartburn. I've got indigestion. I've got all these things rumbling and tumbling, And you see, this is what sin is like. You see, this is what Peter is saying. He's telling the people then, he's telling you right now in this moment, your sin, it didn't leave you satisfied then, and it sure won't leave you satisfied now. What Peter is saying to us, you've already been there and done that, so don't go back to that. Look, Peter is asking you today, what is there really worth going back to? He's saying, why would you go back to those things that might have felt good in the moment, but ultimately left you feeling empty? Why would you go back there? Why would you go back to that for which you feel shame for in your life? Why would you go back to what made you feel defeated in the first place? Listen to me. I don't know your past. I don't know how many wild oats you've sown in your life. So maybe for you, it was a lot. Maybe for you, it was a little. But either way, Peter's saying, it's been plenty enough. Like, I don't care this morning if you're here and you're older or younger. You don't need to keep on sowing. You don't need to extend your stay. No, now is the time to check out from your sin. So we see that we stop loving sin by recognizing, hey, we've been there long enough. We've already worn out our welcome, if you will. Secondly, what Peter shows us here, we stop loving our sin 
by remembering there's judgment coming for our sin. And so if we were to think back to our childhood, if we were to think back to when you were growing up, let me ask you this question. What was it for you that kept you from doing a lot of stupid things? Now, granted, I know some of you. Some of you did a lot of stupid things. Some of you still do a lot of stupid things. But in general, like what was it? What was at least one of the factors that kept you from doing something stupid? For anybody, was it the fear of your parents? Anybody right there? Like, did anybody fear? Like, I know if I do this, I'm going to face the wrath of mom and or dad. A lot of us, right? That's how it was for me. Like, I remember growing up thinking, I don't want to do that because I know what will happen from dad if I do do that, right? And even today, I still kind of feel that way. Like, I'm still thinking, I don't want to do this because I don't know what my dad's going to do. I mean, he's not spanked me in a long time, but I wouldn't put it past him. But as we think about that idea, as we think about what it takes to keep us from doing stupid things, I think what we see here is that for a lot of us, it was the fear of our parents. It's a fear of, hey, what will they do? As parents, I just want to say, I think this is a good thing. Like, I think it's a needed thing that our children have a healthy fear of the consequences of their actions. Like, let me throw this in. Parents, your job is not to be your child's friend. Your job is not to make them happy. No, it's to teach them what God has said. Teach them about who God is and how he said to live. And if they don't do that, if they're disobedient, it's your job to punish those actions. It's your job to bring about consequences. And why do we do that? We do that because we love them, right? We do that because we know the truth is the thought of future consequences is what often helps us to keep from present wrongs. And that's what Peter is talking about in verses 4 and 5. When he says, They, the unbelievers, those living outside of Christ, are surprised that you don't join them. In the same flood of wild living, and because you don't join them, they slander you. And listen, is this not the world we live in as Christians? Like, don't we live in a culture where people cannot believe that we won't join in in how they're living? They won't join in in how they're speaking. That we won't join in in how they're thinking and how they approach things. Like, the world can't believe we won't mess around and sleep around. They can't believe that we won't get high and get drunk. They can't believe that we won't lie. They can't believe that we won't watch what they're watching. We won't go every place they go. They can't believe we won't spend our money like they spend their money. But why won't we do those things? Well, first of all, I hope you won't do those things because you've been captivated by the love that God has for you. I hope that you won't do those things because you have seen and recognized the amount of mercy that God has bestowed upon you. I hope you won't do those things because of what God has done through Christ on the cross for our sin. But I also think, I also hope we don't do those things. Because just like kids have a fear of their parents, we have a rightful fear of a holy and righteous God. That's why he says in verse 5, these people, notice it there, they will give an account. They will face the consequences to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. Listen to me, friends. Is God a God of love? Absolutely. Is God a God of second and third and fourth chances? Absolutely. Is God a God of victory? Yes. Is God a God of truth? Absolutely. Is he a God of forgiveness? Yes, he is. And we love talking about those things because they're so true and they're so good for us to think on and dwell on. But hear me. God is also a God of judgment. He is. This is our God. He is a God of wrath he is one to be feared and i think this is where we're missing it even in the church even amongst maybe ourselves you see i think truth we have lost our fear of an all-powerful god i mean i think if we were to put two pictures up here a picture of god and a picture of a snake and I ask you hey what are you more afraid of i think i'm gonna hate the snake if i were to put a picture up of your friends on this side and God on this side, and I would ask you, hey, which one are you more afraid of? Uh, I'm more afraid of offending my friends. I'm more afraid of what my friends might think about me. This is our mentality. But you see, Proverbs tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. 
And because we don't really fear him, we aren't getting wiser. And let me ask you a question. If we aren't getting wiser, what does that mean? It means we're getting what? More stupider, right? Is that not true? You're not getting wiser, you're getting more stupider. Like we get stupid enough to think that I can do this. I can get by with this and nothing is going to happen. Look, and this right here is one of the areas that our stupidity shines brightest. See, I don't know if you realize it or not, but God is omniscient. He knows everything. God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. And you talk about a world of a combination. And you say, whatever you think, what's hidden will be revealed. Whatever you think, hey, I did that in the dark, it will be one day brought to light. And when it's brought to light, it's going to have consequences. It's like we read in Hebrews 10, the writer says, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. In other words, you can claim salvation all you want. But if you just keep on living in sin, you should not be expecting to receive a reward. But no, here's what you should be expecting. But a fearful expectation of judgment. And a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Look, as we see this verse here in Hebrews. As we just saw that verse in 1 Peter in verse 5. Here's what we have to be careful because what these verses are not calling us to do, when it comes to those who are living in sin, and particularly those who are slandering us, who are mocking us for not living in sin with them, we have to be very careful not to take this and go, well, you can say whatever you want about me because I know what's coming for you. Like the fact that judgment is looming, that consequences are coming, is not an opportunity to say, hey, I don't care about you. You see, it's not an opportunity to show apathy. No, it's actually an opportunity to be on mission. It should actually instill in us a sense of urgency to let our friends know, to let our family members know, to let whoever it is know that if they continue to live like they are, like if they continue to live in this sinful, my way and not God's way approach, God's righteous, just judgment is coming. And understand this morning, the judgment coming for an unrepentant, unforgiving, unforgiven sinner will not be a slap on the wrist. It will not be God saying, okay, you messed up, go to time out for five minutes. No, it's going to be punishment that consists of everlasting pain and suffering because this is what sin deserves. And you see, we stop loving sin by recognizing, hey, we have worn out that welcome. We stop loving sin by remembering this right here. There's judgment. There are consequences coming for sin. And thirdly, we see today, we stop loving sin by realizing there is something out there that is better than sin. Because here's the truth. I can sit up here all morning. I can tell you time and time and time again. I can tell you over and over, hey, it's time. It's time for you. It's time for me to let go of our sin. It's time for us to lay aside every way that is clinging so tightly to us. I present to you that the reality is you are not going to leave your sin until you find something that is better than your sin. I think the woman at the well is a great picture of this. And so if you know the story in John chapter 4, you've got a Samaritan woman who is obviously living in sin, who had obviously been living in sin for a long time. Like it was well known what kind of woman she was. It was well known what kind of past she had. Then all of a sudden, this man comes to the well. All of a sudden, she meets this man named Jesus, who she had no idea who he was. And when she met him, the Bible doesn't definitively say. But I really believe that this woman, after years and years of living how she wanted to live, after years and years of trying to find her satisfaction in her sin, finally left her sinful life behind and why would she leave that sinful life behind? What was the cause of that? Because she had found something. She'd actually found someone who she knew would be better, would be more satisfying than how she was living. She knew that this man would be more satisfying than living in her sin. And you see, I think this is really what Peter is getting at here. I think in these verses where, again, he's reminding these scattered Christians who are probably tempted to say, well, if God is going to let me suffer like this, 
Like, if my life is going to play out like this, then I just want to go back to living how I was living before. I think that's what he's reminding them. I think he's reminding us today, who, again, are at times tempted to say, well, maybe that sinful life wasn't all that bad. Like, maybe that sinful life did have some good aspects about it. What he's saying to you today is don't forget what's better. Like, I think his whole purpose in these six verses was to point them and to point us to the one who is better than sin. I think that's why he says in verse 1, Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same understanding. So you need to think the same way that Christ did. Because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin. Now, does that mean as a Christian that you are not a Christian if you sin? Like you have to be completely done. There's no room for error. I hope not. Because that would mean your pastor is not a Christian. I know some of you are like, I had my suspicions about that. But that's not what this is saying here. That's like John Stott said. He said, sin and the child of God are incompatible. Hear that? Sin and the child of God are incompatible. They may occasionally meet, but they cannot live together in harmony. Look, why are we doing all we can to be finished with sin? We see in verse 2, in order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desires, but for God's will. And look, as we read that, we've got to ask the question, what does this really mean? You see, what I think this really means, it means that when temptations come, and we know in our lives these temptations are coming, so when that temptation comes for you to lust, when that temptation comes for you to steal, to lie, to covet, to envy, to retaliate, to put down, to dishonor, to slander, here's what you need to think about. Here's what you need to arm yourself with. This truth that Jesus Christ went and suffered on the cross to pay for our sin. But not only did he go to the cross to pay for our sin, no, he went to the cross actually to set you free from the bondage of sin. It's like we saw earlier in 1 Peter. In chapter 2, verse 24, he bore our sins on the tree so that we no longer be slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness. You see, because we are no longer slaves to sin anymore, what that means is that when those thoughts come into your mind like this, like why would I deny myself this experience of pleasure when it feels so good? Like why would I tell somebody the truth when I know it's going to cause conflict? Like, why would I give money to the church when I can spend my money on what I want? Like, why wouldn't I just say this about that person? Because it would make me feel better. It would make me happier. But you see, when we arm ourselves and those thoughts come into our minds, here's what we can know. We can know there's no way. There's just no way that Christ went through and suffered all he did to make our lives harder. He didn't go through what he did to make your life more miserable. To make your life worse. No, he went to the cross. Hear me, brother. Hear me, sister. To actually make your life better. Like we can rest in the facts. What Christ accomplished through the shedding of his blood must be so much better. Must be so much more superior. It must be altogether that much more satisfying than what the pleasures of sin can offer to you. And so I tell you today, believer here today, struggling with sin, and maybe that's all of us, Man, that's every person in this room who say, I'm really struggling with sin. Here's what I would tell you. Sin seems like the better path. It seems like the better choice only when Christ isn't in his rightful place. Listen, why are you here this morning struggling so much to be done with a particular sin? Why does that sin still seem so appealing? Why does it still seem so appetizing? Because the truth is, you are not clearly seeing Christ for who he is. You're not dwelling on what Christ has done and what he's offering to you. And you see, what is he offering to you? He's offering to you lasting joy. Again, he's offering superior satisfaction. He's offering you true contentment that sin promises but can never actually deliver. You see, unbeliever here today. Those who have not repented of their sin and trusted in Christ. When it comes to your sin, I know it can feel weighty. It can feel like a lot. But what he's offering to you, he's offering to take your sin and bury it into the depths of the sea. 
Like he's offering to remove and renounce everything you've ever done outside of his will if you would just repent and believe. But maybe this morning you're living in sin. Would you repent and believe in the Savior? Because like it's been said, if we hide our sins, God eventually will drag them out into the open. But if we right now go ahead and bring our sins into the light, here's what God does. God immediately goes ahead and covers them up. Praise God for that. And because this is what God has done through Christ for our sin, I tell you, like we started, now it's time. It's time for you and I to stop loving our sin and start leaving our sin before it's too late. Look, it's time for us to say, I've had enough. I've had enough with sin in my life. Look, I don't know what that sin is for you. But maybe here, and you need to say, I've had enough with that anger in my life that's just simply out of control. I'm done with it. I've had enough being angry towards this particular person. I've had enough of responding to my wife and my kids in anger. Maybe for you, you need to say, I've had enough of living the luxuries and conveniences of this world. I've had enough of making life about what seems best for me. I've had enough being greedy. I've had enough making everything revolve around money in my life. Maybe you're here and you think, man, I've had enough. I've had enough clicking on that link. I've had enough in my life watching that trash destroying my marriage and my family. Maybe you're here thinking, I'm, I've had enough. I've had enough lying. I've had enough lying to my spouse. I've had enough lying to my kids, lying to my boss, lying trying to make things better for me. I've had enough of it. Maybe you're here. You need to say, I've had enough sleeping with my boyfriend. I've had enough sleeping with my girlfriends. Maybe you're here and you need to say, I've had enough jealousy. I'm done with it. I've had enough of being prideful in my life. Maybe you need to say, I'm done with judging anybody. I'm done with talking bad about anybody. Look, there's a long list of things it could be. But whatever it is for you, hear me, church. Please, please, please don't be like Mr. Truman. Don't be foolish enough to love where you're at so much that you are not willing to leave it when there's a volcano coming for you. I tell you, please be done with your sin. It's not worth it. Be done with your sin before it's too late. J.C. Ross said, I'm about done. He said, a time is coming. Did you hear this? A time is coming when many will repent too late. When many will believe too late. When many will have sorrow for sin, too late. They'll begin to pray, too late. He said, many shall wake up in another world and be convinced of truths which on earth they refuse to believe. And he said, hell. Hell is nothing but truth known too late. I present it to you. It's time for you to stop living in sin and hate your sin. I can't. I can't do it. I can't get away from it. I close day with this. What Matt Smithhurst said. I love Matt Smithhurst. He said, the only thing, the only thing greater than your capacity to love sin is God's capacity to help you hate it. Would we pray to God right now, whatever sin is in your life, God, help me to hate it. I want to live for you because you sent your son to die for me. God, we come to you. We know this has been heavy. But God, we thank you for your grace, your grace upon grace. God, I just pray asking that our church would be a repentant people. God, the world would look at us and say, they don't live like we do. They don't talk like we do. And God, help it not to be about us, but to point them to your Son. God, if there's anybody here this morning who's struggling with sin, and I say anybody, the reality is, as many of us, we're struggling with sin, we're battling, we're fighting. God, would we just lay it down at the foot of the cross? You have paid the price for our sin. You want to cover it over. God, just help us to be honest. 
Help us to be truthful. Holy Spirit, just illuminate us to know truth and live in it. God, we love you. We thank you. We praise you always. You have given us so many reasons and you have given us the opportunity to have breakthrough. So God, would you work? As we close out this morning, praise in Christ's name. Amen.